So I know you're always weighing up whether you should be a data scientist or a data analyst. And because I'm super biased, I'm always like, be a data scientist. So to even the playing field, today I got a big time data analyst. None other than Mo from Data with Mo to discuss the differences between the two roles. I know by the end of this video, you'll have a much clearer idea of what suits you. As a data analyst, how much time are you spending in each of your respective technologies within your tech stack? I would say I split my time between, uh, I would say fairly equally, like 25% each. So Excel, SQL, Python, Tableau. Yeah, I use them weekly. Python, again, just to clean and do some really laborious stuff. Nothing, <laughs> honestly, nothing fancy. I have a couple of functions that do pretty good things for me because I just add it to them. You know, like it's like a catch-all bucket. Yeah. But kind of when people give me bad data for anything, I have a couple functions that just kind of clean and transform dates, text, names, you name it. I just add it in and I'm like, if this happens, use <laughs> yeah. this. Um, Excel, definitely quite big. I've been using Tableau so much recently, especially this year because... I think it's just one of those things that you need to be able to communicate your insights to your audience. And uh, I think that's why Tableau is, is really important. And I would encourage anyone, even if you don't work in a super technical role, to present whatever you have in a nice way. This, yeah. again, goes back to writing just better emails, right? Make sure your resume is properly formatted. Yeah. But I would say I definitely, I split my time uh, equally between the tools I use. Okay, that makes sense. For me, I would definitely say I spend like 60 to 70% of my time in Python. And that's where I'm building models and what have you. Let's say 60%. And then I actually do spend a fair amount of time within SQL because I have to engineer my own data. And I think from what we've discussed, one difference is actually the way that we use SQL as a data analyst compared to a data scientist, because you're mainly using it to query the data, right? I often have to like engineer the data. So like to build those relational tables and what have you. So that's a slight difference there. And I do a lot of Tableau as well, again, because the data department is so small. So keep that in mind when I'm mentioning that if you, if you're a data scientist at a bigger company, you won't be doing much of that and barely any Excel, to be honest, uh, maybe like 2% of the time. I'm pretty sure my percentages didn't add up <laughs> to a hundred there. <laughs> The other time I'm presenting, let's just say that. <laughs> but how important is our uh, maths and coding to your role? Math is more important than coding, so you can definitely get by without doing Python. Like I mm. said, all the stuff I do in Python is the background stuff. So it's the stuff that no one else can see, but it's super useful to you because you can solve your problem so quickly. Math, I think if you are very good at math, it'll definitely help you, but you don't need to be super advanced initially. So if you know distributions, skewness, mean, median, mode, mm -hmm. you know, positively skewed, negatively skewed. You can do some standardization, normalization. I think you'll be fine because it's just data analysis at the end of the day. It's about ad hoc analysis and adding business value by solving business critical problems. So these are like yeah. human created problems. Like, so you need to go and identify and ask those, uh, ask those questions. If you could just summarize, what factors should somebody consider when deciding whether to be a data analyst or a data scientist from your point of view? Are you really good at math? If you think you are, honestly, just be a data scientist because you'll make more money. You'll, in general, you'll make more money. I'm not saying that, you know, all data scientists get paid more than data analysts. It's probably, I would say, the career with more professional growth involved because of machine learning and AI and the way it's going. I feel like Data analysis will always be there, but I feel like the capabilities and the potential of data science at the moment is probably higher than data analysis. So yeah, if you're good at math and like when I say you're good at math, you understand probability statistics, advanced econometrics, and you can do matrix multiplication in your head. That's what I consider you're good at math. If you can like add up two numbers and you're good at just like, you know, nine times six, 54. Yeah. It is 54. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then you're probably not great at math. If you enjoy creating visualizations, if you enjoy finding ad hoc insights and working with people and facing off to the business and, and find something and be like, this is what I found and this is what you should do, I think you should be a data analyst. Whereas I'm sure in your role, it's gonna be so math heavy that I think we had this debate as well that I said, I think anyone can become a data analyst because you don't have to be great at math and coding. Yeah, You can just be mediocre at math and like 
bad at coding <laughs> and you can still be a data analyst. Whereas yeah. I feel like to be a data scientist, and this is where you can absolutely disagree with me, you need to be great at math and you need to, need to be great at coding because otherwise there's no way you do the job. But I feel like a lot of people, math may not come that easy for them because it's something that you cannot just learn out of sheer willpower. I feel like I feel like it's like arts. So I cannot draw. I simply can't. <laughs> it's like if I if I look at my phone, it's just an iPhone right now and I had to draw it, I wouldn't be able to because my brain is just not wired that way. And I feel a lot of people feel the same way, you know, about math, about advanced math specifically. I'm I'm going to push back on that more because I believe that anybody can learn to be a data scientist and can learn maths and coding. Now, not everybody can become a great open AI level data scientist or machine learning engineer for sure. But to pick up the skills required to just be a good data scientist, I believe it's learnable. So even going on your drawing example, if I forced you to draw eight hours a day for the next two years, do you still think you'd be a bad artist? Where I honestly think yes, because <laughs> you, you, you just haven't seen my incapability of, yeah. of, of painting, drawing, anything that's, that's artsy. It's just my brain's not wired that way. I don't know why. <sighs> I guarantee eight hours a day for a year, you wouldn't be Picasso or like Da Vinci or whoever, but I think you'd be like a really good artist. I think, okay, let's put it this way. The one thing I think we can agree on is the barrier to being a data analyst mm. is much smaller than okay, the barrier yeah. to becoming a data scientist because you need so much more. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there, there I can agree with you 100%. So on a day-to-day -day basis, how are you most commonly providing value for your business as a data analyst? I solve ad hoc questions. So that's the number one reason I go to work. I barely do any BAU reporting and dashboards. Actually, I don't do any BAU stuff. So business as usual stuff. Mm -hmm. All the problems I solve at work, they, they just come to me from my business stakeholders. They have an issue. They're like, hmm, okay, why is the data quality profiling so bad here? Or why is it so good here? And then I try and connect the data quality profiling with the end product. So say, for example, we could have a mortgage product and uh, like the conversions are rising, for example, or we have uh, a phone app in which we have a bunch of email address changes or customer name changes, so on and so forth. And uh, it's not accurate data. So why isn't it accurate? Should we run a campaign? you know, to prompt people to update their addresses and phone numbers. So think of questions like this, like they are not easy questions. They're really non-linear. They can be super ad hoc. Um, and this is why I'm there at work. So I gather some data. It can be anywhere. So it can be, I can pull it in SQL. It can be in the cloud. I can get it from AWS. It can be somewhere locally, which is usually the case because I figured that the best data, the most insightful one at large companies usually resides in someone's local CSV file. Yeah. because they just have such granular data, right? So it gives you the real insight. Then I speak to my business stakeholders. I understand what they truly want. Is it a dashboard? Is it a reporting? Do they just want like a one-liner answers? Like, what should I do? This or this? Option yeah. A, option B. And then I speak to them. If they're happy, that's it. I move on to the next thing and then the next thing. Okay. So does the work tend to be slightly more retrospective? Yes, absolutely. So it's... It, it's not really, yeah, it's not really looking ahead in that sense because that would be predicting things. And I think that brings brings me on to, I guess, machine learning and all the cool stuff you do within the data science space. Yeah, so I'll, I'll definitely say most of my, or a lot of my work, it tends to be less retroactive, but more using data from the past to see what, what the future is gonna be shaped like. So that might be predictive modeling and like you said, some ma machine learning work. But in my role in particular, I also have a lot of NLP work. So numerical data is the easiest data to work with for sure. But then text data also has like a wealth of knowledge within it, but then that's really hard to access. So that's where data science comes in with uh, NLP, where you basically turn these big long paragraphs or comment sections for me into easily digestible um, data that you can look at more at a glance. So I'll say that's primarily how I provide business value, which is building models, usually to predict the future or to be predictive and doing NLP work. Those two are definitely the big two for me. The other thing that might be a differentiating factor, how much 
presenting are you doing directly to stakeholders or or clients and who tend to be your clients and stakeholders as a data analyst a lot of presenting and my stakeholders are my stakeholders within the business so if you if you think about a bank you'll have retail banking so th these are like your customer loans your mortgage products your car loans you know like overdrafts you have uh, your commercial banking so this is like loans to big companies like bmw or porsche or volkswagen or you know whatever that may be google amazon and then you have investment banking where you help other companies uh, raise money by issuing debt you help them strike whatever deals they want to mergers acquisitions so people within these franchises they want different things like if, if you think of investment banking the the data is going to be well much more because mm -hmm. you just have so much transaction data you make trades right so traders they have millions and millions of rows of data real-time data whereas retail banking it's a bit slower it's more like every time say you move money from your current account into your savings account that's one line of one line of data recorded so because we capture different data people want different things and these are the people i face off to so they come to me with some kind of ask and then we figure something out together but they are my external internal stakeholders so i don't face uh, off to yeah. anything outside of my bank anyone mm -hmm. outside of my bank because i don't specifically sell anything yeah so I, my role doesn't generate money to the bank in the sense that a relationship manager would, because you would just go out and you'd be like, oh, hey, let's, you know, do some business here. Yeah. You come bank with me and then, you know, we'll make you a good deal. So these are the people I engage with on a yeah. daily basis. So I connect my own data team with those non-technical teams who are just simply after solving their data problems, whatever that may be. Ah, oh, that makes sense. So... You, t you present to people within the company, but outside of your data department, essentially. Yes. That makes sense. And in contrast to a data scientist, or at least my role, is that people I collab with are usually also behind the scenes. So other data scientists I work with a lot. So it's maybe even one step further back from what you're doing. And then if somebody is going to present either to the company, but be because we are a smaller company, it tends to be two clients. I usually get the data together for the person who is then going to present to those external facing clients. So I, I think data science is one step further back down that chain, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Or w in my role. Would you want to present to oh, external Oh, yes, I love presenting. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I think it's good to get your face out there, essentially, and... I like to try and do things which I think I'm not good at. So I've been trying to improve my presentation, speaking, obviously things like this help. So talking directly to clients, I think is just so valuable in my opinion. Did this video help you decide what you think is better for you or do you still have a bunch of questions? Either way, let me know down in the comments below and make sure you check out Mo's channel as well. If you want a free roadmap on how to become a data scientist, you can get it for free on my website, datanash.co.uk. And if you want to know my regrets as a newbie data scientist so that you can avoid them, check out this video right here.